reasons yet, but uh, this morning I've been asked to give a review of our great truth on God is my doctor, and I feel impressed to do that. So we'll uh, spend this next 45 minutes looking at this very wonderful and powerful theme and bring to light in this subject some points which we have not brought into it in the past, which I think are quite critical for its uh, successful presentation. Let's turn to our base text again in Ezekiel, I mean Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. Exodus 15, verse 26, where God declared the position which belongs to him and him alone in the great ministry of healing. Um, so I've got that reference, please. What's the reference? <clears throat> and he said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, be near to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Thank you very much. Now, I mentioned before, of course, that uh, the European translation that says, I am the Lord, your doctor. Your maker is your doctor, is the, is the title I like to give to God in this respect. We turn into Psalms 112, I believe it to be, where we have the same glorious promise revealed to us in this, in this, in this situation. Psalm 112, verses 3 and 4. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. That's the wrong reference, actually. Psalm 103, verse 3 is one. Um, so this, is, this is the one, yes. Let's read verses 1 to 5, shall we? Bless, one to five. bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Thank you very much. Now God says he forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. So if God heals all our diseases, to, to, to whom else do we need to go? Nobody. Nobody whatsoever. Now, I don't have volume three of the testimonies with me, but I'll just quote these statements and live as best I can. I have it, Fred. What's the page? I've forgotten the page involved. I'm sorry. Okay. I guess you got the whole thing there, haven't you? Yeah, everything. Please prove a prophecy, right. But uh, Sister White mentions the fact that Adam and Eve were given tremendous physical vitality in the Garden of Eden, 20 times the electrical power we have in our minds today, in our bodies today, and therefore they were immune to disease for the first 2,000 years despite their wasteful, wanton use of their physical powers. So at the flood, there was a race of great people, thank you very much, of super people who uh, faced the flood without the mark of sin and disease upon them. But, but, but by the time Jesus Christ himself came, the effect of, of, of disease was really marked upon the human family. So, much so he spent most of his time in the actual healing of the sick more than in preaching. The need was so great in that area. Now, I'd like to go back and minister to him to a page here that uh, shows how spotlessly healthy he was during the entire period of his... Uh, Earthly sojourn should be around about uh, I'm doing this just a little bit too impromptual I think this morning or I forget my main statements but um, in the chapter called The Nature of the God page 51 we find in the first two paragraphs a description of the perfect health that Jesus Christ enjoyed during his earthly ministry Page 51, the first two paragraphs, please. The Savior's life on earth was a life of communion with nature and with God. In this communion, he revealed for us the secret of a life of power. Jesus was an earnest, constant worker, never lived 
their mom there among them. Another so weighted with responsibilities. Never another carried so heavy a burden of the world's sorrow and sin. Never another toil with such self-consuming sin for the good of men. Yet his was a life of health, physically as well as spiritually. He was represented by the sacrificial lamb, without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1.19 In body as in soul, he was an example of what God designed all humanity to be through obedience to his law. Thank you very much. Ministry of Healing, page 51. Now, Which book? Ministry of Healing. Ministry of yeah. Healing. Right. <coughs> now, Jesus Christ came into this world at a time when the human body was at its lowest ebb. In other words, most liable to open to infection in all human history. Just as he came at a time when the power of sin was at its greatest and the human being was most prone to fall into its deceptive power. Weakened by 4,000 years of sin, Christ had a complete heredity of that 4,000 years of degeneracy and he got to meet his mother the same flesh and blood which he had at that point in time with all his proneness to fall under the power of sickness and sickness and disease. Yet, uh, we, we've stressed in the past, of course, that uh, Christ gained the victory in the same flesh and blood as who? As the children at what time in Earth's history? When wickedness was at its very height, temptation was at its most powerful, and the human organism was at its weakest. And in that flesh and blood, in that situation, what did Christ demonstrate so far as sin is concerned? He could live how? Sinlessly, without sin at all. Likewise, he came when the human body was at its weakest and disease at its strongest and lived what kind of life? Per a life of perfect health. Now, this demonstrates that we too can live the same kind of life in both the physical and the spiritual <coughs> realm. As Sister White says, in body as in soul. Right? In body as in soul. He was an example of what God designed all humanity to be through obedience to his laws. Now, when it says here what God designed all mankind to be, does this cast our minds forward to the second coming and beyond that, or does this refer to right now? Right now. If Christ could do it right now, which means of course when he was upon this earth in the same environment, if he could do it, then that proves that we too can do the same thing. Does it not? Now, this is where folk are really tested because we can pretend to be born again and get away with it. We can build a very nice, uh, modified, improved and look like a born again Christian, can't we? As foolish versions, we can mingle with the true people of God and seem to be entirely and truly born again. But it's pretty hard to co cover up serious sickness, isn't it? It's pretty hard to say God has been my doctor and get around on crutches with high fevers and uh, wasting diseases and so forth. It doesn't work so well. So this, this is a very testing truth in that, in, that, in that regard because of that. Now, today, of course, mankind is once again descending into the same desperate pit of sickness as it is back in the days of Christ. Everywhere there's diseases. Some of them never heard of before. And some of them are quite incurable as far as man's present science is concerned. So billions upon billions of dollars are being spent today in a desperate <coughs> way to find health. Now, page 551 in volume 5, Sister White says there are many ways, you finish it for me, of practicing the healing art, but there's only one way which heaven approves, right? Many ways, but only one way which heaven approves. The next rest of the paragraph goes on to talk about the application of natural law for the most part, and... Uh, has been in the hands of the naturopathic people and the nature group a very strong step in, in their support so it would seem. But now there are three main categories of the healing art. First of all there's the, well I'll say first of all, we could not you know, be first of all of course, but we've mentioned first of all the practice of the great drug machine called the medical practitioners. At the end, what do they call them? Uh, AMA. AMA. AMA, right, thank you very much. Then there's the world of the naturopath, the chiropractor, the, uh, the uh, 
the natural healing system, as it's called. And last of all, there's a system which recognizes God to be our doctor. Now, all three, well, which, which are the most popular, which is the most popular of the three? The AMA. The AMA, right. There are millions of folks with their trust in that. The next most popular? Natural. And the least popular? God's way. God's way. As usual, God's way is the least popular man in a world filled with sinful creatures. It's so called false God's way, like the Pentecostal churches, and they're always talking about healing, God healing. But in certain areas, they will run from the doctor occasionally too. Well, that's true, especially, especially the healer himself. Uh, Lloyd Rosenbaum, who used to be a doctor, probably still is a doctor in Colorado, was visited by one of these faith healing preachers, a powerful and very popular and well known one too. And uh, Lord Floyd asked him the question, Why doesn't your faith healing heal you as well? And the man replied, He said, I can heal others, I can't heal myself. So I depend upon doctors to heal me. And uh, my, contention, my contention is, of course, that uh, how can we possibly bring the truth of healing to others, others if we don't experience the truth ourselves? How can, you, how can you effectively preach the gospel if you don't experience the gospel? How can, how can you do it? Let's, um, to confirm this, let's go to 1 John for a moment. And uh, we'll note there the, uh, the fact of this, that we must first of all experience the power of the gospel before we can possibly communicate that same power to others effectively. The uh, first epistle of John, and it should be the first chapter and the first four verses. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which is with the Father, is manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that also, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father, these things be right to you, that your joy may be full. Thank you. Now, in, in this, John is making the point very strongly there that what we have seen, or we know for ourselves, that we declare to other people, <coughs> that's the only way it can possibly be. Uh, I'd like to find the statement in Desire of Ages where Sister White talks about, uh, it's on page 340, Desire of Ages 340. And this deals with the experience of those two madmen that came rushing down to destroy Jesus Christ and his disciples, and from whom the demons went into the, into the swine who plunged over the, over the cliff and perished. And then Christ sent those two men, with no theological learning yet, to witness to him amongst their friends and neighbors. So it says they could tell what they knew, what they themselves had seen and heard and felt of the power of Christ. And we'd like to read the paragraph, someone please, the, the two restored demoniacs. Page 340. The two restored demoniacs were the first missionaries whom Christ sent to preach the gospel in the region of the Catholics. The Catholics. For a few moments only these men had been privileged to hear the teaching of Christ. Not one <coughs> sermon from his lips had ever fallen upon their ears. They could not instruct the people as the disciples who had been daily with Christ were able to do. But they bore in their own person the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. They could tell what they knew, what they themselves had seen and heard and felt of the power of Christ. This is what everyone can do whose heart has been touched by the grace of God. John, the beloved disciple, wrote, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, 1 John 1, 1, 2, 3. As witnesses for Christ, we are to tell what we know, what we ourselves have seen and heard and felt. If we have been following Jesus step by step, we shall have something right to the point to tell concerning the way in which he has led us. We can tell how we have test tested his promise and found the promise true. We can bear witness to what we have known of the grace of Christ. This is the witness for which our Lord calls, and for want of which the world is perishing. What a wonderful paragraph it is, with a beautiful comment on 1 John chapter 1.
Now, it becomes obvious, of course, if you wish to be a successful medical missionary, what must you experience, first of all? The ministry of God in your own body. You must yourself have been healed from sicknesses as great or small as the case may be, so you can tell what you yourself have seen and heard and felt and experienced of the love and the power of God. We, we can't talk theories in this thing. We must talk realities. We must talk... We must talk the living truth of what we have found to be true in our life experience. Let's add some of the main words again. They could tell what they knew, what they themselves had seen and heard and felt of the power of Christ. That, that, that they could do. Could they discuss doctrine? No. Could they preach theories about the gospel? No. no. Could they argue great uh, foundation principles? No. no that they had been touched by the living power of Christ and they could tell that and they did tell that and wonderful of course were the results as witnesses for Christ we are to tell what we know what we ourselves have seen and heard and felt we can bear witness to what we have known of the grace of Christ this, this is the witness which our Lord calls and for one of which the world is perishing so there's a challenge then that we are to experience God's saving power physically, mentally and spiritually and then we have something of worth and power and value to tell to a perishing world around about us. Now let's examine the three great uh, ways of healing and see how they correspond to the three great religious positions held in the world at the present time. Now, with the drug medication program and surgery and so forth, we must admit that some remarkable miracles or seeing miracles are achieved by the doctors. Microsurgery, for instance, and heart transplants and uh, various, various procedures do indeed produce remarkable results. We must admit that fact, must we not? And be honest about it too. But um, the program is based on the conviction that you can't really recover uh, health, that, that, that sickness must be controlled or brought up under the power of uh, a dr drug medication. But what, is, what, what do drugs actually, actually do? They change the nature and location of the disease which breaks out later in a worse form than before. So that um, it's, it's, it's a system where man, man's, man is made, made to appear to have recovered but in fact has not recovered, right? That's, that's, yes. Well, what, the, what drugs do is actually suppress the body's own immune system. That's true, right? And that allows other disease to pop out someplace else. Sure. Now, is this akin to popular religion? Is it likewise a suppressant? Sure. Right? They teach, of course, you must control and subjugate the carnal mind. Modify it. Modify it. Bring the old nature under, under, under the power of reason and make it appear a person is well, in fact, he's sicker than ever. And so both those practices, practices in the medical field and the, and the spiritual field coincide with one another quite, quite completely. Now, to a child of God, naturopathy is a very strong recommendation, or at least seeming rec recommendation. And we do find that... Uh, before the message came on God is my doctor, that was the alternative that folk turned to away, and away from the doctors with their drugs and so forth. Now it seems a very commendable approach, does it not, to take natural remedies, diet, uh, herbs and so forth to restore health. But where's the fallacy in that idea? Say again. Well, they would argue they do depend upon God. They say we depend upon God to help us as we use these. For cures outside of themselves? For what? For cures outside of themselves? Well, that's not so bad. It's depending upon the remedy and the helper, or Christ as the helper. Yeah, right. The remedy is the doing God is the helper. Yeah, but for cures outside of themselves, they would argue that the remedy is the doing God is the helper. It's based on the argument or principle that uh, if the breaking of the law takes away my health, the keeping of it will give it back to me. That's, that's the logic involved in naturopathy. The breaking of the law took away my health, which it certainly does. Therefore, the keeping of the law will give that health back to me again. Um, now, those who have been here before and know, this, know the answer to this little proposition, please be quiet. 
promise. And I'll put this to those who have not been with us before. The broken law of God is a life taker. That's obviously true. The broken law of God is a life taker. Now, if the broken law, which is disobedience is a life taker, what must the unbroken law be? It's a life... There's the answer again. <laughs> they all said it before you. Let me ask another question then. God is the life... The life... Right. This time we are right. Uh, yeah, right. You said the law is a life giver. Okay, which everyone said. Don't, don't feel bad about it because look, we all fell for the same trap. <laughs> it's a universal um, the disposition or natural tendency to say the law is a life giver. But the law is not a life giver. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3 verse 21 to confirm this beyond all doubt at all. And, we'll, and then we'll find out just what the law actually is. It's a life something else. Galatians 3.21, which says, For if there had been a law given which could have given life, second part of the verse, <coughs> then righteousness would have been by the law. So if there had been a law given, which says, that, that says in fact that no such law has been given, but if such a law had been given, then, then certainly righteousness or health should have been by the law. Now, the law is a life preserver. The life must be there first for the law to preserve it. And obeying the law preserves the gift of life which has been given to you, whereas breaking the law takes it away. Let's go back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Before they sinned, they obeyed the law of God to perfection. Did they have life? Where did it come from? God is a gift, right? As a gift that came from God. And day by day as they obeyed the law, that life was preserved or kept safe in their keeping. And they became stronger and still stronger in turn. But when they sinned, then that law became a life taker and they lost their perfect life and became mortal instead of being immortal. And to give them back the life they'd lost, do we find that obeying God to achieve that or did it come to them as a gift? Yeah. As a gift. By Romans 6.23, the ways of sin, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, um, in the world of naturopathy, what, what, what is being done is this, that people expect the obeying of the law to bring to them complete physical restoration again and expect God to bless and help in that program. God ceases to be the actual healer. Nature is the healer. God is the helper or the assistant and the, or the blesser of the healing procedures. Now, in the religious field, what religious belief corresponds to the use of natural methods? No, not Babylon so much. Not, 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 uh, not the great Babylon boys. You know, we're looking for a, a people who are very particular about keeping the law as a means of restoring them to spiritual health, first of all, and the same people keep the law to restore them to physical health. Legalist virgins? So these virgins, right. Legalists? Legalists, right. Mostly Christian scientists. That's possible too. Now, <clears throat> there... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Now, before this movement came into being, and even since it came into being, there has been a, a large number of small reform groups springing up around the, the world, and around America in particular. And one thing that all these folk have in common, they all have a health reform program that they, every one of them, but and every one of them has a health reform program based upon obeying the law of God, not upon the transmission to them of the life of God. Uh, all right? Now, some, of course, emphasize one, one fantastic cure. Some emphasize another fantastic cure. And it's true, of course, that some of these programs definitely are good, are good for you, but they are not healers or restorers of physical health. Now, each of these groups, when you question them, you find they do not understand the simple principle of the eradication of the old man and the implantation of the new. They don't understand the new birth message and therefore don't experience it either, either the physical or the spiritual realm. Now, what is the third uh, approach to this problem? Right, not nature, <coughs> not drugs and injections, but God is my doctor. 
and I want to show them just the way in which he does go about this healing program. God is our doctor. Now, in, he's also my saviour, and he operates the same way in the, in, in the work of salvation from sin as in the work of salvation from disease and sickness, the same way precisely. And in this field, of course, it's according to your faith, be it unto you as Christ said again and again. I'd like to go back to the Ministry of Healing for a moment and um, read one of my favourite statements in regard to the um, harmony between the faith that, that the Gospel is the healing power for both the body and the soul. I'm going to need to be about page uh, 111. Yeah. Page 111, Ministry of Healing. I'm going to take the first paragraph first of all, please. In the Ministry of Healing, the physician is to be a co-worker with Christ the Savior ministered to both the soul and the body. The gospel which he taught was a message of spiritual life and of physical restoration. Deliverance from sin and the healing of disease were linked together. The same ministry is committed to the Christian physician. He is to unite with Christ in relieving both the physical and spiritual needs of his fellow men. He is to be to the sick a messenger of mercy, bringing to them a remedy for the disease, for the diseased body, and for the sin-sick soul. Thank you very much. The gospel which he called was a message of spiritual life and the physical restoration. Now, note the words again, the gospel, singular, not plural. That's what I didn't say, the gospel, but the gospel which he taught was a message of spiritual life and the physical restoration. So how many gospels are involved? One. Only one, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God to save from sin. And that gospel doesn't have a special little adaptation to the physical problem. It, it is used in the physical realm where any changes, modifications at all. It is the power of God to save from sin and to save from sickness. As the statement says, it was a message of spiritual life and of physical restoration. Okay. Now, what is it that makes this movement? What is what is the heart of this movement? The gospel. Okay. From the very, from the very beginning of our of our work, it, it was born as a gospel message. Now let's um, draw upon this for just a moment. Various movements spring up on the basis of various issues. The Adventist Church, of course, sprang up on the basis of prophecy. They had gospel back there too, of course, but uh, their great thing was prophecy. And for the rest of their history, what do they tend to emphasise? Prophecy. Played away from them completely, where's, where's the Adventist Church? nowhere. It's, 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 it, 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 it falls apart. Now, coming to the Seventh-day Adventist Reformed Church, what was the great basis of their beginning? The law. The application of law. The great quarrel in Europe over the military question, over health reform, Sabbath keeping and so forth. And when they sprang into life because of, a, of a, an issue of a law, what do they tend to emphasise the rest of their history? Law again, right. Now, when, the, when John Wesley or the, or, the, or the Methodist Church came into being, it came because of the work of the great preacher John Wesley, John, John Wesley in particular. Before that man began to successfully build a church organisation under God's direction and leadership, what did he experience? The Gospel. Remember the story how he walked down the oldest gate road in London? And the Moravian preacher was preaching from the writings of Luther. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and Wesley found the gospel that night, went forth to preach the gospel and the living power of Jesus Christ and built the mighty Methodist Church. And to this day, even though they've lost the life and power of the gospel, in fact, they still emphasize the theory of the gospel as taught by John Wesley to this very day. Now, coming to our beginning, what preceded the building of this movement? The, the discovery of? 
the gospel, the power of God to save from sin, the preaching of that gospel has been the source of power in this movement now. What we must do at all costs is to safeguard at any price that wonderful gospel God gave us at the very beginning. And no modification can be permitted to that uh, basic message upon which every other facet of our truth has been built since that time. So, we have the advantage then of knowing the gospel, experiencing the gospel, and having it work in our lives both in the spiritual and in the physical realm. I'll turn the page now to page 113 in the same book, Ministry of Healing. And um, here we have some glorious promises. Now, I really, I really need to go across to page 115. And I want the paragraph read, please. When the gospel is received with purity and power, it is a cure for the malady which resided in sin. When the gospel is received in its purity and power, it is a cure for the malady which resided in sin. It is a cure for the maladies that originated in sin. The Son of Righteousness arises with healing in his wings, Malachi 4, verse 2. Not all that this world bestows can heal a broken heart or impart peace of mind or remove care or banish disease. Fame, genius, talent, all are powerless to gladden the sorrowful heart or to restore the wasted life. The life of God in the soul is man's only hope. Thank you. Begin by saying, when the gospel is received in its purity and power. What do you understand by those two words, purity and power? Is there a difference between them? What is a pure gospel? Something unadulterated by error. Right, it's, it's the, it is the gospel in its purity, in its life and its certainty, and in its power. Now, what is the power of the gospel? The healing presence of God in that thing, right? There's actual power in the word. If I just find the statement, I'll run across it now to another statement to confirm that particular point. Because I wish you to really see that there is actual power in the word of God itself. Uh, Little fellow in the book, Sister White, talks about uh, the fact that uh, in the Word of God is the actual power of God, the same as was in that Word when he spoke it back upon this earth long, long ago. One, is it on one, by two? one, two, two, that sounds about right. I'll check it out and see here. One, two, two, you say? Well, the first paragraph on one, two, two. That's the one, yes, thank you very much. I'd like to read it, please. Give your place back in 114, 115. You want the same power? That's it, yeah. The same power that Christ exercised when he walked visibly among men is in his word. It was by his word that Jesus healed disease and cast out demons. By his word he stilled the sea and raised the dead. And the people bore witness that his word was his power. He spoke the word of God as he had spoken to all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament. The whole Bible is a manifestation of Christ. Thank you very much. So the same power that Christ exercised when he walked among men is in his word. Now let's go down to uh, the, first set, the first sentence of the next paragraph. The scriptures are to be received as God's word to us, not merely, not written merely, but spoken. And the next paragraph of one. That the next paragraph said with all the promises of God's word. So, with all the promises of God's word, in them he is speaking to us individually, speaking as directly as if we could listen to his voice. It is in these promises that Christ communicates to us his grace and power. They are leaves from the tree which is for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22, 2. Received, assimilated, they are to be the strength of the character, the inspiration and sustenance of the life. Nothing else can have such healing power. Nothing besides can impart the courage and faith which give vital energy to the whole being. Now, it doesn't say, well, thank you first of all for reading that. It doesn't say that through these promises, but in these promises, Christ communicates to us his grace and power. In the word itself is the power of God. Come back now to page 115. <clears throat> and we're promised here, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, the life of God in the 
soul is man's what? Only hope. Is that true spiritually? Yes. Is that true physically? Yes. Right. In both cases. <clears throat> My scratchy voice again this morning. Let's now take the next paragraph on page 115. The love which Christ diffuses for the whole being is a vitalizing power. The love which Christ diffuses to the whole being is a vitalizing power. Every vital part, the brain, the heart, the nerves, it touches with healing. By it, the highest energies of the being are aroused to activity. It frees the soul from the guilt and sorrow, the anxiety and care that crush the life forces. With it come comes sincerity, serenity. serenity and composure. It implants in the soul joy that nothing earthly can destroy. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Health-giving, life-giving joy. What a paragraph. Page 115, the ministry of heaven was. Now, the love which Christ diffuses for the whole being is a vitalizing power. Take the word love, the love which Christ diffuses. That, that love is Christ's life, it's Christ's power, it is Christ's medicine. And when that is diffused for the whole being, it's a vitalizing power. What does diffusion mean? A diffused love. To go throughout. To permeate, right? To saturate every part of the entire being. It is a vitalizing power or a life-giving power. So if you wish to have life and health, what do you receive then from God to achieve that? His love, his life, his health, his power. And as you receive it into yourself, it becomes a vitalizing power and every vital part, the brain, the heart, the nerves, it touches with healing. So every single day we should be receiving a fresh dose of this kind of medicine, should we not? Every single day. And what's to stop us from doing so? Only unbelief or preoccupation with worldly things. So Christians should have strong hearts, sound nervous systems, and uh, an active mind with good memories. Um, by it, the highest energies of the, of the being aroused to activity. When it comes serenity and composure, it in plants in the soul, joy of nothing else that can destroy joy in the Holy Spirit, health-giving, life-giving joy. Now, early in the week we, we, we came across a problem, we discussed a problem in regard to this, and that is that uh, when I first preached the message, God is my doctor, there were some people who grasped the truth of this with, with gladness of heart and went home and applied the message and got, got wonderful healings. But a little later and more serious troubles came upon them, they applied the same precision, did, did not get the same results and were thrown into a certain confusion as they realised the thing was not working this time. Now, here's the situation, they heard the message, went over and applied it by faith and got results and it was good, very encouraging, very confirming. But a little later, maybe a week or two, a month or two, they serviced another disease of, of, of stronger capacity and strength and with the, with, with the same confidence they went to work on this as well but did not respond to their prayers in the same way and they found themselves bewildered, uncertain, unsure and, and troubled and in fact quite discouraged to do a certain point and they stopped praying just stopped right there and prayed no more about the thing they, they didn't know what to do and we have to realise that uh, Christ in, John, in Matthew chapter 9 According to your faith, be it unto you. So larger problems require larger faith, don't they? And therefore, the faith which gave us the healing over the small, insignificant melody back there two or three weeks or months ago, as the case may be, is not sufficient to give us power over the present, more deeply seated problem. We need to realise this fact and not be discouraged about it. Elijah understood that principle because when he had faith to deal with the King Ahab all that long day on Mount Carmel, and when he prayed late and, and, and the rain didn't come, he didn't say, well, what's gone wrong? He simply said, my capacities must be enlarged. I need to strengthen my faith to reach to a higher level, you know, with the cope with the present problem. And he prayed and prayed and prayed for that capacity and got it. And 
the rains came. So likewise, if we find that the message works once but not the second time, it's not the fault of the message. It's not the fault of the message, is it? you proved that already. Where lies the fault? In our low level of faith, our small capacity, and therefore what does that realisation spur us on to do, or should spur us on to do? Go to the source and pray more and more and still more until we do get the victory of the thing and hang in there, grasp the promise and cling to it until, we, until heaven does here. Bearing in mind, of course, that all the way through, we are constantly on, on a, on a person-changing prayer, not on a God-changing prayer. And we'll find that we will get results and we will achieve wonderful things in consequence. Just don't give up praying. Just keep on hanging until the victory is finally gained. Now, our last few seconds of time, and time has almost run out so quickly. How does God heal? He heals by the flowing of his life and health into the sick person. The same as God gives to us salvation from sin by flowing his righteousness in to take the place of the old unrighteousness or sinfulness. When Christ was going to heal Jairus' daughter, the woman touched him who had the issue of blood, and Christ said, Virtue has gone out of me. And, that's a, and that, that, that brought the healing to this woman on that occasion. Now I've been quite impressed a number of times in the statements in the Spirit of Prophecy, that's why I used the expression that life flowed from him into the sick and they are made whole. Let's go back to page 17 of Ministry of Healing to find that very point. Page 17, and it says, From him flowed a stream of healing power, and in body and mind and soul men were made whole. Got the picture? From him flowed a stream of healing power, and in body and mind and soul men were made whole. So it's the life of God in the soul that brought about the results in Christ's day, and that's why it says the life of God in your soul is man's only hope. Christ in you, that is the hope of glory. And the hope of health as well. So, Jesus came to supply restoration to us physically, mentally and spiritually. And that wonderful stream of life flows from him to the believers. And I'll close one final statement because we consider that ministry here on page 8, I think, to eight to five in the Zion of Ages we learn that, that, that the word of Christ that we too are to do likewise and um, it's page 825 sure enough the power of love was in all Christ's healing and only by partaking of that love through faith can we be instruments in his work if we neglect to link ourselves in divine connection with Christ the current of life giving energy cannot flow in rich streams of us to the people at those words, God designed that a current of life-giving energy shall flow in rich streams from us to the people. From us. It doesn't say Christ, although of course that's where it comes from originally. Now obviously of course we must be depositories of that love. We must, we must receive it first before it can flow from us. Okay? So God designed that in our medical missionary work we shall be repositories for the actual love and power of God, the health of God, the virtue and life of God. And as you come in contact with the sick, that should flow from us into them to bring them restoration. Well, the bell's about to go, so I'll stop at this point. Any questions you'd like to ask in regard to this presentation? One second, Gina. Romans 8 uh, verse 3 says the law, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh it refers us to it wasn't so much the fault of the law but the fault of the flesh that the law could not work but it was intended to yeah, as a life preserver yeah. now what my question would be is once we have life how do we then apply the laws as life preservers, do we, do we take herbs and what have you? Sure, sure. Yeah. So what we've done, of course, is, is reposition the law. The law is a life giver, and now the life preserver. The same, the same herbs and treatment which we previously looked upon as being uh, a life giver have right. you know, now become the life preserver. All right. Yes, Kippur? I'm a little confused because, uh, well, yesterday or the day before, you mentioned that Paul was afflicted with disease throughout his ministry. And obviously he was a man of faith, but uh, I know Ellen White was sick quite often and she died partly as a result of a broken hip. Did 
Well, no, no, I'm really serious. Are you really? Yeah. Well, I'll just read. Uh, yeah, I see a contradiction there myself. I, have a, I don't see a contradiction. Is there isn't any such thing. I see a contradiction, right. Yeah. 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 The seeming contradiction. Okay, well, just in brief, uh, go read uh, God Sever's Rest, there's two or three chapters in regard to uh, what are they called again? Uh, oh, I've forgotten now, but uh, the promise that God will heal our diseases holds good, of course, all our diseases, but sometimes God permits Satan to afflict us with disease in order to prepare us to give a witness that we are very, very happy to give, as the case of Job, John the Baptist, and Lazarus. That's in particular, of course. So it's a big subject. I don't want to really try and cover it here this morning. It's just far too big. But those is, those diseases are laid upon us by the devil. They're not our diseases. And, uh, I just wanted to bring out the thought that all sickness is due to lack of faith. You're right. Well, I didn't try and cover the entire subject this morning. It's just too big to do that. Any further questions? Well, let's see if we can get the cam photograph right now. Shall we all file out and bring some forms with us, perhaps, to stand upon?